What up, guys? It's Marie Shadows of the Square Circle Podcast, and you guys are in for a treat. I have my buddy Adam Woods. He does MMA and wrestling content. You can find him on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter, everywhere possible. You can find Adam Woods. His content mainly consists of MMA and various wrestling coverage. And he also interviews the best in both worlds of MMA and wrestling. In this episode, we talk about the Endeavor and WWE merger. We talk about Bloodsport. We talk about our favorite stories with Jacob Fatu, my time at MLW this past Thursday, and more topics. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, whether you are watching it or listening. And if you are doing both, please make sure to tell a friend. Let them know that there is more content from Marie Shadows on all major platforms and video sites. This little mini discussion or interview was hosted and live streamed on kick.com forward slash Marie Shadows. All right, guys, let's get to the video and I hope you guys enjoy. Um, Also, can I just, I appreciate you so much. Uh, You didn't have to, um, uh, you know, oblige to me when I had, uh, when, when I had you on the podcast, you didn't have to do that at all. And you've also been like a constant support. So I just fucking Mari Yamasaki's here. I, I appreciate it, man. I like I really it. feel like your family, man. So I appreciate, I appreciate it. that. Yeah, I I really do because um I get it. You know um you know sometimes if work has to like call you in or whatever, like I'll make the accommodation. Like if we didn't have the ability to do it, like at this time, I would have been like, yo, let's set it up for some for some yeah. other time. You know, there's no nothing in the world that would have like my Easter is my favorite holiday, and like I said, I'm not religious, but yeah, it's just kind of a weird backstory. That was the last time, like, my parents were together. We still lived in the Bay Area and San Francisco and whatever. So that was the last normality of my life, right? Uh-huh. And we went on an Easter egg hunt at a place where my mom used to work. She used to work for a rec center and what have you. So Easter is my favorite holiday. But like I said, if you wanted to do it, like, 8 o'clock your time, 5 o'clock my time, I would have woke up at the butt crack of dawn to do this on my No, dude, because no. Because you're See? that important. <laughs> I, I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. I really do. But like, honestly, I would have felt so bad. I would have been like, yo, that's torture for him. Like, no, no. I can't do that. <laughs> I, I, I Again, the, from from Tuesday to, I want to say Monday, uh-huh. right? Because uh, we went to Fifi Dobson at the Roxy on Tuesday. And then Bloodsport was at Thursday. Yeah. And then Friday. Yeah. So I, I think I might have had. A cumulative from Tuesday to Monday was 16 hours sleep. And then I woke up like thinking I was going to be like good or whatever. And then that the news announced, you know, and my phone fucking blew up at like yeah. five o'clock Pacific standards um, AM. Yeah. So I was like, ah, I'm not sleeping. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's great. But yeah, um, you know, first of all, uh, I should say welcome to kick. Because we're not on, uh, we're not on Twitch doing this, so okay. we have a bunch of brand new eyes. So first and foremost, you know, uh, put yourself over, let them know uh, who you are. Even though I've been putting you over all day, like you know, but go ahead and do so. So, uh, what's good, party people? This is according to Woods, and I am a interviewer and podcaster for both, uh, actually, combat sports. Right, I cover MMA, pro wrestling. Boxing, Muay Thai, left way, whatever. People getting dropped on their head. I have an uncanny <laughs> fascination with people getting dropped on their head. I don't know why. Um, and if you follow me on the socials, which is also at According to Woods, you'll probably, when I'm not podcasting, you'll probably see somebody in my timeline getting dropped on their head or set on fire. So that's, that's in the words of the immortal Mark Henry, that's what I do. That yeah. is very accurate, yeah, because we do cover sports where people get dropped on their head many, many times, and we've been there, we've seen it live and all yeah. that, and it's so great. So, you know, uh, yeah, I've been putting you over, like, all day. I was like, yeah, I'm going with on my podcast with uh, Adam, you know, he does MMA stuff, so if you like that kind of stuff, come over, because I think 
now we can finally say that your dream has finally come true with this with this merger like i remember the first time we ever talked when i was on your podcast you asked me a bunch of questions of like you know do i think mma and like wrestling could go together and yeah on some level it does now it's like your dream come true so the first question would be how was your initial feeling about it well, you know what? It's funny because about the same time of day, which was like, again, the butt crack of dawn, um, <laughs> I went on Raja.com, right? And they were like, uh -huh. WWE Hall of Famer is the president. And I was like, oh, shit, Jesse Ventura made a run in. And then it was the 45th, you know, and <laughs> that is what it is, right? So uh -huh. about the same time of day, right? I wake up at the uh -huh. fucking middle of the night, cold sweats and whatever, because my phone is blowing up. And yeah, uh, the WWE, and I guess we we should say right because one a lot of things. I mean, Aaron Hawani, a bunch of other people have said like, oh well, you know, the WWE got bought out, right? And yes, this is true, but mm -hmm. semantics, right? Because essentially, what happened was Vince McMahon's fifty one percent of shares got bought out by WME Endeavor. They uh, parent company of the UFC since 2006, but also the, I mean, prior to the UFC's acquisition, they were the largest uh, talent agency in Hollywood, which, I mean, I'm kind of Hollywood adjacent on the West Coast. So, I mean, it's 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 all a fair and love and war. So, again, the same time, like, it was like 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time in the morning when like the you know Dana White sharing the graphic of it, which you so uh, you know uh, eloquently have here right the WWE logo belt and the UFC logo belt and I'm a bit of a belt mark um, uh -huh. and I love wrestling and I love MMA but I hate either of the designs the UFC belt looks like a fucking paper plate that you encrusted in gold and then the WWE belt is just product placement at its worst form. Uh, you know, I, I grew up with the winged eagle, not to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, age myself, but also the big eagle, you know, the undisputed, you know, the, the flat one, the Eddie Guerrero title, as I affectionately uh, call it. Like, there yeah. were some great title designs, even the mid-card titles, the IC belt, um, incredible design. Um, but those two belts, that tells you all you need to know. It's all about making money. Right. And at WrestleMania, both nights, as well as NXT uh, take, what is it? Stand and deliver. And yeah. then also the adjacent superstore. You can find those at $450 a pop, folks. That's USD. That's not crypto. That's not. No, that's that's <laughs> American. That's it. Yeah, America. it's American. Right. <laughs> so whatever, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, I didn't think about it like that because I never really gravitated towards the look of um, the UFC belt. So I was just like, eh, you know, it is. But now that you put it in that context, I can't unsee it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, well, you know, uh, I, I and it's uh, amazing that I got to meet him. But Keith, Keith Elliott Greenberg, who's uh -huh. a New Yorker, much like yourself, but he wrote uh, the Ric Flair to be the man book. Right. Uh -huh. And there was a great story about like, Ric Flair and Terry Funk, like wrestling, you know, in their, in I think Flair's den or something like that, right? Uh -huh. And like Terry Funk actually has, he's like naked and he has like a, a, like a Bowie knife in his teeth and he's searching for something, right? Uh, and of course, <laughs> even though that's not, I mean, I love that story because I love yeah. Terry Funk. Uh, yeah. Flair is whatever, but uh, and I'm sorry sure. if I piss people <laughs> off, but uh, I, I think Vern Gagne of the AWA is better, but that's another story for another day. But my thing with the with title belts, whether it be especially in combat sports where you literally fight tooth and nail, you get CTE, you break yeah. your nose, you get kicked in the head, whatever, whether it be super kicked or you know, Muay Thai kick, it's still a kick to the head, right? But if you're having a Think of that scenario of Terry Funk and, you know, Ric Flair, right? Wrestling yeah, around mm -hmm. and all their wives are around and there's a yeah, party yeah. setting. Well, if you have something hanging over the fireplace of your accomplishments, you might have it in your office, right? Uh -huh. And somebody who's not equated 
to what you're into, what your chosen profession is, whether that be uh, a fighter of any sort or a professor. And I think they're one of the same. But if somebody was just like Joe Blow down the street, it was like, what's that? And you should be able to say, this I want because I'm the best at what I do. Oh, yes. my God, that's so beautiful. So that's my kind of uh, rubric, right? If you're fighting for something, let it be something amazing. So when I see like two millimeter tin can fantasy uh -huh. football belts or, you know, a replica belt of some sort with just, you know, the WWF or the UFC sharpied out, you know, on a piece of tape, <laughs> then you know what? You died for fucking nothing. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> you got kicked in the head for nothing. Like what I can get for, again, $400 on WWE shop. And that's not worth it to me. But if it's for you, I'm not mad at it. I totally get that now that you explained it so much because you dropped some pretty, like, really good hot takes. So I was like, whoa, hold on, man. Like, this whole thing is about Endeavor and WWE. But then, like, you not like Ric Flair that much. I was like, whoa, hold up. <laughs> oh, there's going to be some inside baseball, folks. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. Um, th th this is why, like, I love talking with you anyway, so we could get off, off on like tangents and also doing that. But, um, yeah, now I understand. Uh, so before we like dive right deep into this, you know, I always ask like wrestlers that I talk to, but now I'm gonna ask you because I'm curious about this. Uh, in no particular order from one through five, what are your top favorite belts in professional wrestling? Okay, so Winged Eagle. Uh huh. Uh, so Winged Eagle, uh, probably the AWA Inmate Championship. There's two AWA World Title. Well, actually three, right? Um, there's one that's like a three plate deal, and that's the one where if you Google machine the AWA World Title, that's the one that comes up. But the inmate title was actually uh, made by the inmates of Colorado State Prison that Vern Yanev commissioned. And it's like the, the I guess, the Ric Flair big gold belt, but better. Because uh -huh. it's all in silver and whatever. It's just so different, and I like that, right? So uh -huh. that would be number two. The eight pounds of gold, or the ten pounds of gold, the Sweet Charlotte, that is number three. Yeah. Uh, the IWGP... The, the the previous version one. Four? Yes. Version four. Yeah, that would be it. And then, yeah. you know what? Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm on here and you might have a close <laughs> association, but uh, let's give a shout out to the good brother, Court Bauer and MLW. Yeah. Those title belts from the the middleweights and, and, and he's taking from MMA, middleweight. He's not, it's not cruiserweight yeah. or anything. He's, he's you know, barring from combat sports, which I, again, pro wrestling is a combat sport. So I would say any one of those, the MLW title, the MLW middleweight, the tag teams, uh, that's awesome. And then an honorable mention to the NXT UK titles. And you pick one, just throw a dart. You pick one, <laughs> whether it be the men's, the women's, the tags. I think in terms of the WWE universe, those uh, for the time that they were active, those were the best, I, I feel, in the WWE universe. So that's a pretty like big list from one to five, which was really cool. All right. So the big topic is Endeavor. Um, so I was reading up on it and like, you know, all we know right now is that like Endeavor got the 51% of like shareholding while right. WWE has like the 49%. And then Endeavor paid Vince the $9.3 billion he wanted. Yep. First of all, when I heard that number, Okay, my brain was like, Vince can't be serious. He wants $9.3 billion for WWE. Who has that other than the Saudis, right? But then Endeavor comes along and buys it. And I'm like, oh, shit. Where the fuck did you guys get that $9 billion from? You Matthew know, McConaughey. Seriously? <laughs> I mean, dude, Anthony <laughs> Kiedis is a, you know, there's, if you, I mean, there's a UFC tonight. I, I, literally, as yeah. we're speaking right now, right? Yeah. And, um. If you see a celebrity in the crowd, uh -huh. chances are they are a, I mean, it could be a minority share, but it is, they are essentially some of the people that helped Endeavor purchase the UFC back in 2016. So yeah. Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, maybe a Matthew McConaughey, maybe a Jeremy Piven, maybe a Halle Berry who did a oh. Netflix MMA movie, which, oh, 
not the greatest. Okay. But um, I mean, if you dig it, you dig it. Uh, but yeah, so if you see celebrities in the crowd at UFC, chances are they might have a little bit more than just ticket price. They might have a share in the company. This is why, like, I need you because I don't think in UFC terms, like, you know, I'm I'm used to the conversation of like, all right, WWE has shareholders, and when a shareholder sells their stock, they get like money. So I understand that, right. and this is why I need you because I was like, oh shit, that's yeah. how they got the nine billion dollars. Yes, and and, I, and, <laughs> and also again the fifty one percent, and that yeah. is something that I think is under the what under the rug swept in the sense that. A lot of people don't know what that 51% is. And we were abreast of that 51% and what it meant, I'll say around Christmas of 2022, right? Because that was yeah. when the, the feelers happened that Vince is trying to make a play back into the company after he paid the illegal paralegal and what have you. Yeah. And, you know, th their business, right? And it yeah, would yeah. be their business if it weren't a publicly traded company, right? Yes. And then we we found out, right, after Vince kind of sent the feelers, there were people that were like, oh, if I drive, back, you know, uh, by, you know, oh, what is it, uh, Titan Towers in Stanford, yeah. Connecticut, hey, there's a light on, and that light on is Vince's office. I can pick, and I know exactly what it is. And it was <laughs> after everybody went away, right? So we heard that around, you know, late 2022, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then, uh, I mean, let's be real, right? So Stephanie, Triple H, Nick Khan were basically like, no, 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 no. You know, we respect Vince and all of his contributions and what have you. And they yeah. thought they they thought they were speaking for the shareholder, which is, I mean, Vince Russo swerved, bro, because <laughs> realistically. Vince was plotting. He already knew he had 51% of the company. And that was kind of drawn out in, what, 2001 when they went public? Yeah, like yeah, right yeah, yeah. 2001, 2002. Um, and that was drawn out by Jerry McDivitt, who has always had Vince's best interest, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't so much that it never bought the entire company, but they bought Vince's shares, which, again, you cannot – pardon the pun, Trump Vince's shares because it's 51% of the company. You could have all 49%. You could be a, the Saudi government and you buy everything on Robinhood, whatever, and it's still not going to equate to Vince's deal. And that's why Vince himself uh, was just like, oh, you guys are trying to shop a TV rights deal? Cool. You're not doing it without me because I'm 51%. Uh -huh. I might be retired. I might not be in yeah. Europe, but guess what? I'm still here. So that's essentially that 51% is essentially what Vince himself sold Endeavor. And again, okay. that is the majority stake. Now, in terms of what that means, right? It's very yeah, yeah. similar to what the the acquisition of the UFC uh, happened in 2016, right? Because yeah, yeah. Um, it was a you know, the UFC's biggest pay-per-view to date was UFC 200, right? And they had oh, yeah. that, yeah. And they, I mean, they, they had. A I remember that piss yellow, uh, you know, canvas. Which I mean, it was supposed to be hallmarking the greatness of the UFC as a brand and everything. I thought it was just like Brock Lesnar's PED test because uh, it was just fucking piss yellow, <laughs> just endorphins and everything. But um, so, and then so Saturday is UFC 200. By Monday morning, yeah, that's when. Everything from Variety to Entertainment Weekly, the TMZ, everything was like, oh, Endeavor bought the UFC for $3.8 billion, right? Yeah. So, again, into semantics, um, going into lockdown, and it, it's weird, two years after the fact, we're still talking about lockdown, but yeah. I think it relates, right? Because yeah. essentially, um, going into the lockdown, Pretty much, the UFC was a money loser, right? Even with their respective and hefty rights fees that included, uh, you know, as a UFC consumer, right? You have to pay ten dollars a month for ESPN Plus, yeah, and then once a month and sometimes twice a month, ninety dollars, in addition to the ten dollars that you're already paying for the UFC pay per view, right? Now. That's no, Nick Khan is looking to a similar strategy 
uh, for the uh, WWE Network, wherever that may be, whether it be Peacock oh, or what have you. So, again, uh, make your, in the words of Jerry Lawler in one of the WWE <laughs> games, make your uh -huh. words soft and sweet just in case you have to eat them later. So, Ooh. yeah. So, so again, so WrestleMania 39. Yeah. The biggest uh, event that WWE could put on two nights, 80,000 plus. Oh and everybody God. talks about just that, right? We're not talking about the merch. We're not talking about no. Undertaker's one-man show. We're not talking about the Special Olympics stuff. We're not talking about NXT Stand and Deliver. None of it. Just Mania alone, right? Mm -hmm. Over 160,000 people in... I'm sorry. It's Inglewood. It, I grew up in okay. Inglewood. So, <laughs> so there's that. It's Inglewood, California, right? Yeah. Still so away from LAX. But right after that... Monday morning, right? Right after, uh, within twenty, uh, within twelve hours of Mania Night Two concluding, well, we hear across the same outlets that reported the UFC purchase back in twenty sixteen, yeah, that Endeavor bought the WWE, and again, fifty one percent. Man, it's like um, I want to say like history repeats itself in a way, but um, you know, I think that. Uh, um, Ari, uh, like knew know? what he, yeah, like he knew what he was doing, what he wanted. Cause even in that interview that, uh, it was him and Vince, yeah. um, and they were talking like, you could just hear it that like, he was like starstruck, but then also like, you know, he got something that like, you know, he wanted. Um, and it's kind of weird to be like, yo, he got 51% of the shares and Vince is like, Vince has a boss. So to speak, you know, yeah. and it's like, bro, Vince I has mean, a boss. <laughs> Vince McMahon and Dana White are co-workers, which is even yeah. weirder. And their boss is the guy who inspired Jeremy Piven's character in Entourage, the HBO show. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's Ari Gold is Ari Emanuel. <laughs> Again, this is why I don't, I can't understand anything else. There's so huh. much in, in combat sports. Yeah. But I can't watch a Marvel movie. I can't. I, I I know nothing of the other world outside of a ring or a cage, right? Couldn't give a damn because again, the best stories are in uh, the combat sports realm, and uh, yeah. this week has been no different. Definitely, man. Like you know, you you and me see eye to eye, and the whole like story is in almost everything that like that we fucking love and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to like. Throw in a little uh, story, which like, you know, you don't know this and most people don't know this. But uh, aside from like all the wrestling and stuff. So I also do like gaming with like my boyfriend and my cousin and stuff. And we have like a gaming channel. So when UFC 200 came out, right, uh -huh. <laughs> we watched it. <laughs> and then like and then like the next day, what we did was we basically turned on our UFC game. Uh -huh. We made a video. We, we named it UFC 2000. That thing has a thousand views, close to wow. two thousand views. Where we were like, it's it's my boyfriend and like his cousin playing the video game, setting up the similar matches and like some fantasy matches, and just like talking shit on the game and stuff like that. And like it reached like a thousand to two thousand views, and just because we we were on that hype train of UFC two hundred, just called the UFC two thousand, <laughs> and like it took off. And yeah. I was just like, man. It, well, kudos to times. all of you to figure it out because <laughs> MMA Twitter that Monday was fucking abreast. I'm never watching you again. Which is again similar to what we Wrestling got on Twitter. Monday. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh never, my god, you know, man! Uh, like people were like, oh, I'm gonna watch Bellator. Bellator's <laughs> numbers haven't moved one iota, and Bellator is the second biggest MMA promotion owned by Showtime, Viacom, you know, MTV and Snooki or whatever the fuck. Yeah. yeah, the same thing owns Bellator, right? Uh, actually, to do one further, because you remember how Tony Khan, before all of this, had this big announcement, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I thought would happen? Because especially <laughs> Tony Khan was saying, like, oh, we're in the hunt. Like yeah, he yeah, alluded yeah. to him and his dad fucking buying the WWE. Yeah. So I what mean, do you think? I, I, I've met Tony Khan. He's a lovely gentleman, but it, it wasn't happening. But I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, Fight Fight Network up in Canada, right? Anthem, yeah. right? Yeah. They own both 
Impact, but also Invicta Fighting Championships, an all-female MMA promotion, which is the, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, they were the, and still are, the mm -hmm. echelon, the major echelon of what a woman's MMA could and would be and should yeah. be, right? I was like, fucking Tony Khan, take those two, buy it. It's a little bit more in your price range. You'll probably still run <laughs> it into the ground, but fuck, okay. <laughs> it's it, it's more to his price range. That's yeah, hundred percent. We gotta scale our expectations, and I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Impact and uh, and and Invicta would be the way to go. <laughs> um, we have uh, Swanky uh, in in chat. He loves our vibe. Uh, it's very upbeat. Uh, I appreciate you being here, man. Um, so you know the management team. Um, you know, as people can see here on the screen. Uh, so just as a recap, uh, Ari Emanuel is the head owner of uh, like the two. The new company, now. That, uh, I guess TKO is the ticker symbol yeah, that they yeah. registered, right? And then Vince is uh, a, like his second in command. Yeah. Like his, his basically in Star Trek terms, his number one. Yeah. Um, I have I can't even see the other people's names, but I I mean like you I know what? Like in the words on. of the Rock, it it kind of doesn't matter, right? Because. <laughs> I mean, here is it. Vince, That's true. I mean, Ari Emanuel, Vince, and no disrespect to anyone else. I mean, yeah. they probably have bigger bank loads than I do, and you, you know, um, by the, the, the umpteenth degree. But <laughs> Ari Emanuel, Vince McMahon, Dana White, Nick Khan. Those are the four. If you're doing yeah. four horsemen to ride into the fucking apocalypse, it's, it's that's them. the four. That's the four that anybody cares about. Yeah, um, you know, and... Vince said it himself, like, we're going to talk a little bit about creative because we do have a question in the chat, you know, is Vince back in creative control? Will he have it moving forward with the buyout? First of all, I need I need all of Twitter to hear me. And when you guys, like, rewatch this, Vince is not back in creative. Sit down, guys. Like, he's, like, half and half. Like, I think that he'll oversee, like, certain big stories. Like, if it has to deal with, like, Brock or, like, any of his favorites, like, to see that end goal, like, he'll he'll want to see that. But anything else, he really can't really be a part of. So I don't really think he's back in creative control. Why are you looking at me like that? Did you see Raw? <laughs> Did you see Raw? That was not, listen, that was not Vince. They had, like, a four-day, like, extravagant, like, WrestleMania extravaganza they were all tired like you really believe the super reports that is vince don't don't do this to me okay no no i mean i have somebody that was working for production for oh. nxt stand and deliver and somebody i mean i he he hasn't outed himself so i won't whatever but he's somebody that is pretty well known in the local okay. southern california mma uh sphere yeah uh, like a matchmaker um, and again, I, I remain nameless and it's not a, yeah, yeah, a name yeah, yeah. that is synonymous in a, a household name, but if you're, if you fought in combat sports or the amateur pro in Southern California over the last 10 years, you know who it is, right? Okay. This person, I mean, to the extent, let me, let me, let me drop it to you. So I ended up mania night two uh -huh. on the floor. Okay. On the floor. What the fuck happened? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no, again, I can't. Oh, and, and also, I paid. So I went to NXT, uh -huh. uh, Santa Deliver, right? Mania Night One and Night Two. Uh -huh. You know how much my tickets cost? No, but tell me, it's gonna hurt me. Zero. Oh, you got in. Oh my god. <laughs> I I called it every favor, a good brother. Woo, man. I, I mean, I paid, you have I paid to for merch, but that was just like alms bearing. But yeah. yeah, so I was on the floor for night two, right? So Solo Sakura, and I, I, I hope I'm not spoiling anything. I mean, it's it's Saturday after, right? I You're mean, good, we're, yeah. we're a week removed from night one. Yeah. So if you haven't ordered the Peacock, I don't know what to tell you. But with that all being said, Solo Sakura got ejected. Heyman's talking on his own. And at the same time Heyman is talking on his own, I get a DM from this person. Mm -hmm. And I... And it's not Vince Russo, but it was very Vince Russo-esque in the sense that he was like, watch the swerve, bro. 30 uh, seconds fucking later, Solo cloaked in a uh, you know hoodie, the black hoodie. And he appeared, Simone Smith, Cody, what, you know, the, whatever Roman did. I, yeah, I yeah. stopped giving a shit after that. Once I saw that, 
I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So we were all that way. Yeah. So that's it. Um, can I, I guess I could kind of tell the story. So um, I know Solo, but not of the wrestling uh, deal. Do you so, mean like you know the person, but not his yeah. his contract? I mean, th- yeah, exactly. So okay. <laughs> where I live, there's a Whole Foods. You're, okay. All right. The Whole Foods yeah. is a very boutique-esque supermarket, right? Very My wife worked at the one in the town that I live in, right? Uh-huh. So I go to pick her up one day, and there's this dude. <laughs> Island Tribal Town. <laughs> oh, Whatever, my God. stocking groceries, right? Yeah. And I'm all like, yo, uh, what island are you from? Because I'm part Fijian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you never ask, you never assume, right? I'm not saying that Tongi and Simone's look alike, but if you made that assumption, I've also made same, right? So yeah, you, yeah. But they've been at war more than, uh, or longer than Israel and Palestine, right? So yeah. you don't want to fuck that up, right? So I always go, what island are you from? He goes, Samoa. And I was like, what? And then he's like, well, they ain't no islanders out here. What the fuck do you do? And I'm like, I'm an interviewing podcaster for MMA and pro wrestling. And yeah. Like, and he goes, and he starts oozing me straight up. Oh, and he was like, do you know Rikishi? And I was like, of course I know. I mean, not personally, but yeah, he's yeah. like, that's my dad. And I was like, the fuck? And wow, I was like, just right off the, the bat. Yeah. And I was like, uh, you know, Jimmy and Jay, the Usos? I was like, yeah. It's like, those are my brothers. And I was like, fuck. And, but... <laughs> His name is Jacob, right? And I'm all like, you're Jacob Fatu, but what about fucking um, Jacob Fatu of MLW yeah. fame, right? Yeah. And he's like, no, that's my cousin. <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a, a young uh, Solo Sokoa, right? Oh, and my God. It, you know, people that were, you know, would, you know, fucking office stuff, right? Like, whatever. Mm-hmm. My wife would be in the break room and people mad dog, whatever, whatever. He always, to his credit, always looked out for my wife. He's like, you Aww. good, sis? You good? Whatever. Uh... And then I remember there was one time that she, because uh, at the time he was still training at Knoxborough, right? With his, yeah. with, I mean, his dad was moving, you know, back and forth between Vegas and, and Southern California. And he, he was like, you know what, sis? You know, I'm finally going to going to take up the family name. I'm going to move to Vegas and what have you. And like literally two weeks after, um, I had him on Facebook, right? Two weeks yeah. after, he's at FSW. He makes his FSW uh, debut. Shout out to Future Stars of Wrestling in Vegas. Yeah. And I mean, the rest is history. He starts getting booked everywhere and whatever. And within, well, I to me, it's a year. But obviously, there's a little bit of gap between like the pandemic. There was probably three years. But it mm-hmm. seemed like a year to me, he was at the performance center. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh so I'm I'm always happy to see that dude do well. Um but yeah, that was a, like a weird way that I, I know him. <laughs> that's that's so cool, man. That, that 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 really is that's so cool. But um I I'll, I'll share my uh Jacob story towards the end because I have oh, a very, okay. I love it. I well I mean I guess we should. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get back why into not? like we'll we'll get back into like glaring at each other about like who ran raw or not just okay. because. Fair um enough. so hold on, let me um let me show you the picture actually. Okay. Um cuz like uh yeah, like I'm so grateful for like just working with MOW uh when I get the chance to just do media press. It's always a fun time. Always a fun time. And um, Port Brower is a that was like the first podcast that I ever listened to. Uh, yeah. Is is the MLW the old school him, Conan, and MSL. And mm-hmm. it's funny because he doesn't get the credit that he he deserves because um if not for the MLW podcast and them spinning out, we wouldn't have a Jim Cornette podcast. We wouldn't have a Bruce Pritchard podcast. We wouldn't have a this iteration of Conrad. Oh man! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So go ahead. <laughs> oh damn! That's that's Jacob. Yes. Yeah. Oh man, that's a good brother there. Um, and then uh, Juicy man, fuck, dude. Oh. I can't, I can't tell the juicy stories, but uh, and it's not even, there's, a, there's a gent named Blake Troop, and he's 
a former MMA fighter turned pro wrestler, and uh, he trains with uh, Chris Silvio, who's, uh, I believe, a genocide of the NWA fame. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah the, Chris Silvio's wife is genocide. And even Chris Silvio and Blake Troop are on uh, the most recent uh, NWA uh, Power episodes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, man, those those fools know how to party. What I'm saying. <laughs> I bet they do. All right. So like I've I've talking to Lance like for for a while now. Whenever I see him at like events and everything, so like you know he remember me. It was, it was a really cool time. Uh, we had like media scrum at MOW. Um, and as we're like uh, we like interview three prior to Jacob. Now this is the first time that like Jacob is doing the media press with like us um, in like MOW in New York. So I right. was like. I was like, oh my God, if you had told me like a year or two years ago, I'll be interviewing him. I'll be like, what the fuck is this? Right. Right. Uh, yeah. um, he's a very like cool dude. He loves family. He mentioned like the family line and stuff and just talking about like his match that night against, uh, you know, Johnny Hennigan, Johnny Morrison, you yeah. know, whatever he wants to be called because Johnny Major, like, Johnny Bloodsport. Yeah. So, you know, he talked about that. Uh, he actually like thanked all of us to like, you know, for, for, for what we're doing and stuff. So after that, the night started and then like getting towards the end when like the main event is happening, I went to go look for my person to be like, hey, are we going to have like a post uh, media scrum? Because they, they they usually do. But unfortunately, we couldn't have it, but I was OK. But as I'm trying to look for this person, Jacob taps me on the arm and Jacob is like, oh, you still here, sis? Bro, the fan girl in me wanted to like yeah. come out and just mark out because I wasn't paying attention. I didn't see him. So he just yeah. tapped me and it felt like fucking family and shit. So like yeah. all that, all those feelings, I bobbed it up I, right in here. And all I did was I crossed my arms and I was like, yeah, because I'm, I'm still working. I had yeah. to play it cool that I was yeah. like, oh my God. Uh. Yeah, I, yeah, no, he's, <laughs> I mean, and he's, man, I, I, I hope I'm not breaking KV, but like, again, the most sweetest yeah. genuine uh and and I, I mean not to whatever but that's like island right we we make you feel at home and, and, but it's funny because jacob uh, fatu is the perfect embodiment of a of a polynesian or melanesian man right because yes you know you go to fiji you go to samoa you go to tonga any of the polynesian islands you know you're going to be greeted and love and they're going to put the lay different cultures call it different things right right but yeah. back before missionary days, uh, all of those islands were uh, practiced cannibalism, folks. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji were the worst, right? Uh, actually, that's my favorite Fijian story in the sense that uh, some of the missionaries, right, Christian missionaries came over, right? And just think everything that we know about like the American Thanksgiving, right? Pilgrims, mm -hmm. natives, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, they have the big feast, right? Yeah. The asterisk with the Fijian version is uh, one thing that you don't do, right, uh, is touch a Fijian man's hair, right? And oh. especially it's wild, right? Uh-huh. Um, I, I cut it. I'm Americanized. Sorry, folks. But um, uh, you don't touch the hair, let alone the chief in front of his entire village. So it is said oh. that it took four days to cook the missionaries. Seven days to cook their boot leather. But on the eighth day, we feasted. Ah. Uh, Just say it. That sounds like a... Hmm. So again, Jacob Fatu is the perfect embodiment of the heritage of the Polynesian islands, but also the love and respect that the Polynesian islands have for anybody else that comes into our culture. Yeah, man. Um... I was uh, I was just so happy that night. I was like, that was really, really perfect. Um, and then uh, I probably should have left the picture up, but then like as myself and and uh, my boyfriend was like getting ready to leave, you know, he mentioned to to my boyfriend that like, oh, I'll see you Saturday. And I was like, I wish I wish we could go over to Philly and battle riot and cover that too, you know, but we're not gonna be there. Um, that's why that's why on Twitter I was like, hey, you know, I wish you guys luck. 
at Battle Riot, you know, um, thanks for like all the love on Thursday and shit like that. So, you know, yeah. but which yeah, also, uh, can, can I ask you a question? Ms. Sure, Lisa? of course. Uh, I mean, you are very much uh, a, a new New Yorker through and through. Yes. Yeah. So what what is your take on the uh, on MLW specifically? Uh, basically bringing out the rich heritage of pro wrestling in the New York area, right? Uh, things like the Opera Cup and yeah. There, there's several. I mean, what was the uh, ballroom that they ran? Uh, uh, Melrose Ballroom. Melrose Ballroom. Who yeah. again? Lou Thez wrestled there. Mm-hmm. Ed Strangler Lewis. You know when people are like, oh, my top ten is. You know, I love Bret Hart, so, you know, whatever. But yeah, my yeah. top ten is Hogan and Bret Hart or Undertaker or whatever. And no disrespect to the names that I just mentioned. But if you're yeah. not mentioning Luthez, who held the NWA title for damn near 30 years, a Vern yeah. Gagne, who, I mean, you didn't have to travel if you wrestled in the AWA. Between Minneapolis, like maybe Vegas to mm-hmm. the latter end or whatever, but his territory was a state. And people made six figures, the equivalent adjusted for inflation of six figures, and they were home at night. No Bill Watts yeah. driving like crazy amount of time. No Jim Crockett, and you know, or you know, the the late great Adrian Adonis, right? You know, dying in in Canada because you know somebody fell asleep at the wheel. No, no, no. The AWA guys and girls, with, like Sherry Martell, were home every night if you lived yeah, in. Yeah. The, Minneapolis area. So I'm just saying. So basically every time that MOW comes to New York City, it always feels like a very big deal to be in the Melrose ballroom. And then also to get like, since like, you know, I, I work for like media and stuff and a little bit behind the scenes, like it feels like one big family, like, yeah. you know, everyone is like, cool. Um, you know, I tend to help out sometimes like either putting up chairs or whatever, because like, I don't even like to stand still. I like to, when I go in, I'm like very focused. I'm like, all right, I know I have media to do, but you know, I always ask like, Hey, do you need any extra help with anything? Uh, do you want me to do anything? And most of the time they're like, no, it's okay. You can relax. And I'm like, all right, fine. I'll relax. But then most of the time it's like, it's still a family and they appreciate that. I, I even ask that. And then when the merchandise goes up for like the guys too, I always make sure to like go greet them. And like, you know, if they ever need anything, I'm always there, but like, you know, to bring it to New York, it's one of like the very fun places, especially like the crowd and stuff like that. Um, this crowd was like really good, um, you know. So the tapings that happen, you guys will see it on Reels, on the Reels channel and stuff. Also, um, you know, I, I got to be in the presence of Raven, which was fantastic. Oh, he's in my top ten for sure. Yeah, man. Um, I I tweeted that out. I was like, I got to be in the presence of him. Like, I really wanted to like interview him during like the media press but like they couldn't get him but i was just like man like he's just one of like my favorites man i was like oh my god it's raven <laughs> yeah no 100 percent. i mean everybody looks at you know especially you know post mania 39 and look at the brilliance and it is brilliance of paul Heyman, right and rightfully so but you wouldn't get there and you wouldn't get ECW what we love mm-hmm. without the Raven and Tommy Dreamer, Beulah McKillicuddy, Kimono Wanalea storyline. And it, yeah. you know, in 2023 optics, it's not the most tasteful of stuff, but damn, uh, in the words of Jim Ross, by God, that shit was awesome. It really was, man. But um, I always have a good time at uh, MLW, whether that's like in, in Philly in the ECW arena when I was there for Fightland, that was fun. Yeah. That that was fun. I got to go to the bathroom to take a picture with the with the mural, and it was great. Um, but yeah, either one, like Philly or uh, New York, like they treat it as like a big deal. You feel like you know this is a this is gonna be a good night. You know, um, nobody does anything stupid, which is a good thing. Um, I mean, that's not ECW uh, <laughs> fandom because I mean they were getting stupid there, especially they were. that Holiday Inn. If you know, they- you know. <laughs> They were, but I'm just saying whenever MOW comes there, like the crowd is like, you know, the crowd is rowdy, but they're not going to do anything stupid, you okay. know, cool. like they're not going to do anything stupid where you feel like unsafe. Like I could walk around with no fucking problem and I'll be okay, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. Which, uh, I mean, do you, could, could you ask me my favorite ECW, oh, well, actually ECW <laughs> arena moment? 
Uh, for me or you? Either or. I, I guess I'll go with you first. We got ladies first. Uh, so my favorite what ECW moment? Yes. Uh, man, I don't know why the promo is coming up in my head, but like anything Raven related when he's like talking in the school. There's okay. also the famous thing of like you know Tommy Dreamer with obviously the Kendall stick getting revenge on Raven. Obviously, oh that that weird ass shit with uh, the cross that happened in oh, ECW. Oh, third angle. Yes. <laughs> That that, oh, that 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 weird ass thing, um, so but you also have to remember too that I like I'm I'm 32, so I'm like trying to remember certain certain other things. But I yeah. do remember like just watching just Raven develop and like his storytelling. That's yeah. also like that's also more reason why like I fall in love with storytelling and like the way his brain works and stuff. Yeah. So so yeah, like you know we could say those. Um, okay. Oh, also I should mention this though because I did it for. For last month, for Women's uh, History Month, uh, I watched uh, Jazz versus Steve Carino, which oh. was a very good match. So, like, I watched that match and I have a reaction to it. It's up on my Patreon because I was like, you know, everyone talks about women's wrestling, but like, no one goes and research like yeah. back in the day to go see this shit. So, Jazz versus Steve Carino was pretty fun to watch. Like, the crowd was great. Yeah, Jazz and, and Jackie. Uh, I mean, I know China gets her just due, right? Uh, as we, somebody that, you know, in terms of a fan, right? And, and you know, a filthy casual, right? You didn't have to be yeah. the most hardcore. You saw China and her beating up Jeff Jarrett, and, you, and you're like, ah, of course, right? Yeah. But Jazz and and Jackie, man, I remember watching, uh, and it's, it's it's impeccably well now, but Jazz, I mean uh, Jackie versus Hardbody Harrison on eight, on uh, WCW Nitro, and yes. I, I think it was at the Redneck Riviera La Vila because she, not only did she beat Hardbody Harrison's ass, but uh -huh. she threw him in the fucking pool, and I think that was the same night as Kevin Nash stuck out in his finest like Tony Bahama gear, you know, island shirt and shorts, did a cannonball. You know, from mm -hmm. Lorraine into the fucking Club of Vila pool. Well, that I believe that same episode of Nitro. Uh, I, at the very least, it's the same place, right? Because they ran it a couple years. Uh, but yeah, that that was it. And now Hardbody Harrison uh, basically is in in prison for uh, extortion and and sex trafficking and everything. So again, yeah, her uh, you know Jackie beating the shit out of Hardbody Harrison ages pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so your favorite uh, ECW moments? Actually, so I, I would say an ECW arena moment, which is oh, not okay. even an ECW moment. Uh, CFFC, Cage Fury Fighting Championships, had a MMA fight at the 2300 Arena. But don't you fucking say that. It's the ECW <laughs> arena to me, damn it. Yes. So with that all being said, uh, a guy lost his finger. Because inside the MMA gloves, they oh, were no. kind of grappling and what yeah. have you. And they pull inside the glove, pull inside the glove, and the finger comes off, right? An what? announcement is made, right? An announcement is made, uh, you know, has anybody seen the fucking finger, right? So my friend Brittany Elkin, who actually fought Clarissa Shields, yeah, Olympic boxing gold medalist Clarissa Shields, in uh, uh, PFL, right? She was doing security, uh -huh. one. And CFFC is commentated uh -huh. by John Morgan of MMA fame and the voice of the voice of CM Punk, right? So again, <laughs> my favorite moment is a guy losing his finger in an MMA match. Again, a, 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 a security by somebody who faced an Olympic gold medalist in boxing and... Uh, you know the chick magnet as in as a commentator. So that is oh my, my non-official e favorite ECW moment. ECW that moment. that is wild, man. It's not I my world even, coming together. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, it kept on pulling, what? pulling, pulling, and the only thing that's there is the skin, and you fucking pull that too. Damn, man. <laughs> Hard I'm movie. surprised that it didn't happen in the the. Original ECW because of all the things that yeah. were done. I would have expected it happened then in '97, but no, no, like literally during the pandemic. 
<laughs> you know, you know, wrestling is the weirdest thing because, like, you'll think like sometimes, sometimes these big ass moves will like hurt people and take them out of commission. But it's like the smallest things that you're like, how the hell does that happen? Like the one in the billion chance, you know? That's like this. <laughs> yeah, Rob Van Dam of all the amazing stuff that he does, you know, in the middle of his historic ECW, what twenty two month long title reign or whatever. He fucks his shit up with a baseball slide. If you're RVD on the crux of everything that you can do, that is the least thing that you can. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna bring it back to uh, WWE and Endeavor. And uh, Swanky here does have questions um, sure. for us. So he so he uh, asks as the question of um, as far as creative, what are your thoughts on Seth Rollins? Oh, I think he's the shits. I absolutely in a good or bad way. Hold on. Oh, in horrible, a... horrible. I'm okay. Not, I'm not a fan of him. Um, I think the the pathway that all of the Shield members went, and I, yeah. I knew it was WWE hyperbole of you know they're the greatest faction in WWE history. Uh, oh my god. Let's, <laughs> let's 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 cut that out, right? Yeah. Because theoretically speaking. When, when I, at least for me, right? Shields together, whatever. Yeah. We know Vince is going to push Roman, okay? We, we, we get that. We get that maybe a year or two in, right? And mm-hmm. But like Ambrose, right? Yeah. As he was called. Now the John Moxley, right? Yeah. And I mean, I knew him from, uh, shit, Jersey All Pro and CZW when he was cutting promos with Sammy Callahan when I was on like AOL.live or some shit like that. Like, I, I know that John Moxley, so yeah. I'm not mad at it. But, you know, as Dean Ambrose, right, when he was still in FCW, you know, he was supposed to be in a feud with Regal and a feud with Mick Foley, but Mick Foley didn't get cleared and everything. Like, we heard all of these things, right? And, and we were like, oh, and Tyler Black of Ring of Honor fame, you know, like those two are, you know, if Roman's the guy, well, you know, if you're a hardcore fan, you get the concessions of these yeah, two, yeah. and they're going to be pushed. We didn't get that. Uh, my the only incarnation of I don't care if you call him Blix, uh, Tyler Black, uh, you know Seth Rollins or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only incarnation that I dug was the Monday Night Messiah, right? And that's true. Yeah, that that was my favorite deal. The disciple of you know uh, Murphy mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, the whole Mysterio, you know, Aaliyah storyline. I thought it was great. And then once she got away from it, I, I I couldn't stand anything before it, couldn't stand anything after it, and that's it. Like, him wearing the, you know, the fucking Super Mario boots with the curb stomp and oh my all God. of his weird fucking, ah, oh, just, I cannot stand it. His promos are garbage. Uh, I Yeah. I, and if you're a Rollins fan, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm uh, total disclosure, I'm not a Roman Reigns fan either, right? And yeah, I would yeah. like to see a match with Moxley that he doesn't bleed because, yes, bl- red equals green, but yes. when you do it all the fucking time, oh my god, yeah, it, 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 yeah. So, and again, Moxley is a uh, you know, Josh Barnett blood sport uh, competitor, so I'm not gonna hate on him too hard. I like this incarnation better than anything else. But in terms of Rollins, you know, and especially like when they were like, ah, oh, CM Punk's coming back. And then he's like, no, no, my Philly film. Oh, God, Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> what does anybody see in that guy? Like, I, I look at like, you know, wrestling I loved as a kid. And, you know, the yeah. new generation is what was my jam, right? I'm, I'm of a certain age, you know, uh, one, two, three kid. I mean, he wasn't even one, two, three kid. He was like lightning kid beating Razor Ramon for $50,000. Or, you know, the, the WrestleMania 10, Brett Owen and, uh, you know, Luger and Yoko, like yeah, that yeah. shit, right? So I'm like, I'm using those optics for them now, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm all like, how does anybody like this guy? And again, I'm it's, it's, people like him because he is, the, the pop that he got on Mania Night 1, it's deafening. It's yeah. deafening. He, I mean... So he's doing something right. He's just not my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, because uh, we were talking about punk. Because, uh, yeah, punk, like, you know, punk is all over the place. 
with like yeah. people talking about here and there. But like I okay, so I used to like him because uh he was like my voice of the voiceless. He like allowed me to like, you know, at least get a little more confident in like speaking and stuff. Um, but then like, you know, um, I was with him for the whole entire time until like he did the podcast thing. And then I was like, nah, we're not having this. You're not throwing people under the bus and all that. So I no longer liked him. And then like, I sort of was on his side when like, um, uncle Dave was just bashing him for like the month after the all out thing. And yeah. I was like, how can, how can you like do that? That doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you do that? Like, no one comes to the aid of like, Hey, these reports are wrong, but I yeah. can see what you, I can see that, I could definitely see what you mean about, like, why do people like him? And I chalk it up to, like, people want to live vicariously through him because they don't have the balls to say what he says. Ooh, and Rollins? Oh. I thought, oh. Oh, I thought you said punk. I did say punk. Oh, you did. So then I, I so, okay, I love CM Punk, not, oh. not a Rollins fan. For for some reason, I thought like my wires are crossed, and I thought you were talking about uh, Rollins. No, I'm talking about Punk because I thought. Oh, we, I love we, Punk. We ended. We ended. I thought we ended on Punk other than Rollins. Yeah, I know. I I, I fucking love Punk. Um, I'm I'm in. Uh, I I'm not somebody that saw his earlier work. Okay. And there, there's a couple people that like slipped through my radar in the sense like like I I, I pretty close to his debut, Sheamus was in a hotel next to the arena of where we were, right? And they're yeah, like, yeah. oh, this guy, you know, just debuted for, you know, ECW. And I was like, oh, this Beaker-looking motherfucker. No, I don't want his uh, autograph. I don't want to take a picture <laughs> with him. And then he beat, like, literally four weeks later, he beats, you know, Cena for the world title. And I'm like, oh, I missed that one. Uh, <laughs> you know? Okay. All right. So uh, I'm thinking back to the, the conversation of you talking about Rollins, and I think – I think I know where like I got mixed up when you basically said that you don't know how people, you know, Big like Rollins, him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically I, I associated that with okay. CM Punk because I know CM Punk is an asshole. And, and, and the majority is like, I don't like Punk because he's an asshole. I don't consider Rollins to be an asshole in no, a I don't way. Think, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I know So people... basically my brain was like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we no go. Worries, no worries. No, yeah, I mean, yeah. I know people that know Rollins, you know, uh, his shoot name and whatever. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm not, you know, it, it it's like deathmatch wrestling. Like there's a there was a GCW that I went in the middle of the pandemic. GCW had a show and headlined by Jonathan Grisham as the Ring uh -huh. of Honor champion against Minoru fucking Suzuki. And I went right, and they had a deathmatch match there, right? Yeah, Yeah. And I turned my fucking back because I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I liked it when it was XPW. I liked it when ECW, whatever. But when it was just like two guys in fucking shirts with no build and whatever, you know, they just want to throw light tubes at each other or whatever. Yeah, right. Um, with no psychology. It was great when Terry Funk did it. It was great when Mick Foley did it. I'm fucking, I was all in for FMW and Hayabusa and shit like that. But the guys that were wrestling, I had no, I, it didn't chart with me. And also Seth Rollins. Like I turned my back during this okay, whole media I got match. It. Okay, I got it. I got it. Makes sense. I mean, like you know, um, coming out with uh, the um, I guess the Shawn Michaels sort of a little get up at WrestleMania. Yeah. I was like, why? Why are you doing that? Like you know. Yeah. Why? What yeah. is it? Human nature, right? Why? Why? <laughs> that's that's right. why. And that's my whole take on. And Rollins and even Roman Reigns. I I, I get it. Yeah, just Whatever. like why. Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's um, you know, I guess it's fantasy book for the future for okay. Endeavor and like you know, WWE because uh the video you sent me, I watched mm -hmm. it earlier today and I was like, Oh crap, a lot of this makes sense now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, because uh Again, like if I'm watching something of WWE, I'm not gonna like attribute to it to that. Maybe it's a call to UFC because when uh, the dude in the video mentioned uh, Daniel Cor Cormier, Cormier, yeah, and yeah. shout out to MMA on Point. Uh, you, you could check them out on YouTube. Um, I mean, this is like not a plug, but I go to them for a lot of the stuff. Uh, but shout out to MMA on Point. Uh, but essentially, you know, they kind of chronicled, you know, this whole deal from the, the MMA space because we've if you're in pro wrestling, whether it be a fan, whether you're like Marie and I, a little bit 
inside, you know, or, or even kind of charting on the outside, right? Like, it's not the biggest news. Like, yeah, it, yeah, but it is the biggest news. If you're in our space, it is the biggest news because, like, we've known, you know, a McMahon running that corporation, whether you call it WWF, WWF, or mm -hmm. WWE, right? Um, I mean, a lot, even Vince himself was talking about, you know, his dad owning the company. Well, yeah. again, I'll go one further. Jess McMahon, right? Vince's grandfather promoted pro wrestling and boxing at the old Madison Square Garden in like, yeah, um, yeah what, years 19, ago. 19, yeah, like, like the turn of the century. So literally... If you you count Shane and uh, and and uh, Stephanie, we got four generations of McMahons. We have yeah. almost a hundred of years of promoting something in the Northeast, right? Mm -hmm. And that is no longer. That is a death. I don't care how you spin it. That is a death, right? So going forward, we're going into uncharted territory, much like how um, you know, much like you know, MMA fans were doing with the UFC. They had never known, or you know, the beginning of their UFC fandom was, you know, when Dana White and the Fertitta brothers and the parent company Zufa pretty much promoted Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell, yeah, yeah, and Randy Couture. So they had not known a world beyond that, and now we're here, right? And just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of the future, right? So you know, the UFC, you know, if you're a fighter in the UFC pre the the Endeavor deal right? You got to wear whatever sponsors you wanted, whatever. Mm -hmm. There were fighters that were making six figures on just sponsorship alone, right? And that's not even including their fight purse or their fight bonus, right? So what ended up happening? And I mean, Dana White and whoever would just cut you a check, you know, if they thought you had a good fight and they started announcing it or whatever, right? And that would be something, you know, a, a proverbial gra brass ring for somebody to attain, right? That went away with Zufa because you basically had Reebok fight kits, right? Instead wow. of whatever fighter's t-shirt or whatever, you got Reebok gear. And when they rolled it out, they had like Gilbert Melendez. They spelled it Giblert, right? And he's a former champion, what have you. And just like the lack of sincerity that came across, right? Yeah, yeah. Also, those fight bonuses, right? Those are all about, um, you know, they used to be 50 Twenty-five hundred thousand dollars, right? They went to twenty-five hundred dollars. Mm. That's a bit of a change, right? So, as we kind of saw with the Rey Mysterio, uh, you know, Dominic Mysterio storyline, it was sponsored by Lucha fucking Cinnamon Toast, Crunch, yeah, right. You're gonna see a lot more of it every time they played an ad between whether it be the cricket ad with Miz. Yeah. Or whatever, uh, the, you know, cinnamon toast crunch, um, the turbo tax, what yeah. have you, the booze in the arena. And I know you guys didn't hear it at home, but eighty thousand people booing. It's it's raucous. It's amazing, right? But it doesn't matter because if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And these sponsorships are making sense. And what has been the hyperbole of Vince McMahon's Ideal. He always wanted a big car sponsor, right? A yeah. Toyota, a Ford, or what have you. Yeah, yeah. He always wanted a big beer sponsor, Bud Light, a whatever, mm -hmm. Michelob, whatever. Well, through Endeavor, you get it. Now, what does that mean for the, the wrestlers and fighters? Downside guarantees are going to mean more now than they ever have before, right? Because you're just going to get what's there, right? Yeah. Ari Emanuel is an entertainment guy, right? So he... Yeah. He knows how to kind of finagle things, right? Now, the good things, hopefully, hopefully we get some sort of union because that was something that has been echoed in the pro wrestling space and now in the MMA space for at least a decade. In the pro yeah. wrestling deal, I mean, mm -hmm. Jesse Ventura and, and uh, Roddy Piper in the, like, mid-'80s were kind of champing on, uh, you know, champing for it, and it never happened, Right. So if I'm Ari Emanuel, right, and people in the UFC realm are pissed off that, you know, they have their wrestling in their MMA, 
cool. Or the vice versa, right? WWE people are talking about, oh, I hate this fighting shit, you know? Yeah, I yeah. want Raw for all. I want yeah. fucking Raw Underground. Yeah. Cool. And that's, yeah, yeah, Raw Underground. Anywho, uh, yeah, so if the make good would be like, guess what? Not only are our athletes, both in MMA and WWE, mm -hmm. get healthcare. But yeah, they're on TV, so let's make them SAG uh, union. That's, I mean, if you're the if you're the the head of the largest talent agency in Hollywood, that's what you do. That's what oh, yeah. you do. Yeah. Will it happen? I don't know. I'm I'm looking at you know glass half full, um, mm -hmm. but also corporate. I mean, I remember the total disclosure before the pandemic. I used to drive Uber. I literally picked up somebody in 2016. Right yeah. from Endeavor's uh, oh. corporate office, right in uh, in like kind of West Hollywood, Beverly Hills adjacent, mm -hmm. and they were like, "Oh my God, you speak so well! Like, are you an actor?" And I was like, "No, I cover MMA and pro wrestling." And they're like, "What's MMA?" It's like you know the UFC, like you know the thing that you guys just bought. It's like I've never heard of it. So if people within the company didn't even know what the UFC is. There's probably people that don't know what the WWE is, even with the 21 somewhat. Yeah. So um, it is up to Ari. It's up to Vince. It's up to Dana. Uh, not so much anyone else because they're, you know, not many people know Nick Khan on the pop culture lexicon, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the names and faces that people know, it's up to them to kind of make good for the fighters, for, you know, the, the pro wrestlers and what have you. Will it happen? I don't know. Um, yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. But then the pay goes down, and that's the catch. Yeah, too. yeah, and then uh, probably, probably like you know, new contracts have to be discussed because then you have to talk about like royalties and this and that. And maybe if like you know another sponsorship happens with like Cinnamon Toast Crunch or like a Snickers or like something, you know, someone's gonna be like, hey, do I get a cut of that? You know, so like negotiations and shit, like. It's going to be really wild into the future. You know what I anticipate also, though, on the pro wrestling MMA sphere? There have been a lot of people. So, you know, WWE has a network. Now the network's on Peacock, right? Yeah. The wrestlers, if you watch WrestleMania 2, right, and mm -hmm. the Hart Foundation, you know, in a battle royal, whatever. Do you know how much royalties are going to, you know, the widow of Jim Dan Neinhart, whose, again, daughter just wrestled and it's been in the WWE for quite some time. His son-in-law is a producer for the WWE yeah, for yeah, quite yeah. some time. So do you know how much they got? No, they got I don't. Zero. They got fucking zero. Okay. If you so, fire up yeah. the damn Peacock Network, or if you're living abroad, the WWE Network, yeah. you can still get it. There's nothing, right? Same to it if you're watching UFC 7, right? And Ken Shamrock is on there. I'm just kind of throwing a name out there. Right? Mm -hmm. You know how many residuals Ken Shamrock, who again should, I mean, is in the UFC Hall of Fame, but he should be in the WWE Hall of Fame as well. He's getting zilch for it. So, what I kind of foresee happening is yeah. basically fighters and pro wrestlers, are, and nobody wants to rock the boat. So, there's going to be people that are not on the roster currently that are going to band together. Everybody that you saw at WrestleCon or what have you that don't have a WWE Legends deal or haven't been inducted to the UFC Hall of Fame, they're going to band together and go, yo, we want our stuff. Obviously, you guys know what the fuck SAG is, you know, the Screen Actors Guild. So give it yeah. to us, or else we're going to take you to court. And again, the PR, you know, I, I think the Endeavor or TKO or whatever, they're going to just settle because the PR nightmare that it's going to bring is, it isn't worth it. But also, you know what the funny True. thing about this is? What? NWA went through an antitrust lawsuit, and that's the National Wrestling Alliance, right? Yes. They went through an antitrust lawsuit because if you pissed off a promoter in the 1950s, right, you got blackballed, right? Yeah. Mm hmm Guess what? The UFC is currently going through the same antitrust lawsuit. Currently. That makes a lot of sense, like, because I don't really see some of the big names anymore. Like, I, I see, like, you know, we could talk about, like, the UFC, what, 287 that's happening yeah. tomorrow? 
right? Like, oh, today, yeah. It's, oh, today. it's happening now, yeah. Oh, apologies. <laughs> like, I'm no, no, you're good. for that. I'd rather, okay. I'd, I'd rather be here. Okay, okay, cool. Um, you know, uh, but like the people that I see on that card, I'm like, I don't know any of these guys. So like yeah. when I watched UFC, it was back when you mentioned, you know, like Chuck Liddell, like Tito Ortiz, like those guys, like I, I remember them and then like I just fell off. And then now this is interesting because the next question leading into this is, do you see any type of crossover where maybe um, Ari is like, I mean, Ari is like, hey, can I get, can I borrow Brock Lesnar? Can I borrow Matt Riddle? Can I borrow Shayna Baszler? Like, do you think that we're going to see some type of crossover? None of those names that you mentioned. But, you know, one name that I'm surprised that you haven't mentioned. Conor McGregor. Uh, dude, I mean, he just celebrated his 10 year anniversary in the business, and I'm like, all right, <laughs> I was oh, I mean, like, so, dig on so him. somebody sent me a picture because they, don't, they know I don't dig Roman Reigns, right? And okay. again, that's there's no bearing on yeah, yeah, yeah. Anawahi, the husband, the father, the, yeah, yeah. the kick ass motherfucker that kicked leukemia's ass. Shout out to Joe Anawahi, just the, the again, you're a badass, but you're a SWAT guy, but you sell punches with your SWAT vest. And you're related to two guys who are brothers, <laughs> but they call them cousins in their native language, and they're from a penitentiary. But you're a SWAT guy, and they're from a penitentiary, but you guys get together. Okay. Oh, all right. I love okay. the way you explain wrestling. <laughs> I'm just saying. But with that all being said, right? Um, oh, fuck. I forgot what we were talking about. I what Roman Reigns, when the, it's like water in a robot. It's fucking malfunctioning. We were talking about Conor McGregor because I didn't bring oh, yeah. his name up. <laughs> yeah, so basically somebody shared a, 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 a picture with Roman Reigns with the UFC title, right? Oh. All of his titles and then the Roman. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and the UFC title. And I was like, you did that to piss me off. But <laughs> what's more likely to happen yeah. Is Conor McGregor at 185 pounds? He's the one to end Roman Reigns' streak at, at a, a thousand and two days because he'll beat Bruno San Martino's record, he'll beat Hogan's record, and whatever. So you get that caveat, right? But 100 and, uh, 1002, Monday Night Raw, you'll see fucking proper 12, you know, logos about whatever. That's when you know when you'll see cat, like, you know, almost like New Japan, right? When you see yeah. the fucking uh, sponsorship logos on the canvas, that's yeah. when you know whoever's in charge with TKO, you know, promotions. That's when it's in. That's when it's in. So when Conor McGregor had a thousand and two days or whatever Raw is after that, and he comes in, beats the shit out of Roman Reigns, right, and walks out as the Universal Champion. Oh my God! That's when you'll know. That's when you know the fix is in, right? And again, <laughs> everybody, oh, another thing about it, like, oh, how can Vince have a boss? Or I, I can't imagine Vince with a boss or whatever. What's well, the very thing that Dana White has had to go through since 2016, right? Mm -hmm. And how must Dana White, and I'm not trying to humanize Dana White because he slapped the shit out of his wife. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but imagine you're an employee of five years, right? You met all your sales goals and your expectations. You blew that shit out of the water. Yeah. Right? And somebody from a different fucking company comes in <laughs> and gets your fucking spot. You yeah, want to talk about Art dude. Anderson? My spot? Dana White has to fucking eat shit. Yeah. That Vince McMahon is his boss. All the shit that he said. And he said, yep. like, oh, I, you know, I respect Vince McMahon. But what they do and what I do is different. Vince again. Oh, it's barbaric. Okay, now Vince is the boss. What are you gonna fucking do, right? Right. And, Can't and do the, shit. right. And the the thing about it, right? The 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 pebble in the water, the ripple effect, right? The butterfly effect is, mm -hmm. well, if Dana White doesn't like this current agreement, he walks, right? Whatever the length of contract that he has, because he is talent. He's a figurehead president, right? Vince, yeah. we don't know what Vince's deal is, but that's true. I'm, I'm sure you know, in the next couple of years, you'll feel Vince's um, control, his vascular uh, energy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. with that all being said, if Dana goes, 
There's this guy. I don't know if you know him. He might do the th- the thing that Marie and I both do. This guy, Joe Rogan. You know, you know Joe Rogan? Yeah, we know Joe yeah. Rogan. <laughs> yeah. So Joe Rogan has said, and Joe Rogan being, if you don't know already, the biggest podcaster. He's like Oprah, Dr. Phil, Maury, yeah, on mushrooms, everybody. and hunts elk and whatever, right? Yeah. Joe Rogan has said, if Dana walks, he walks. The day oh. that Dana White says it's done, it's done, right? But I, I respect your, I mean, obviously, I, I dig Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. But Joe Rogan, right, in the sense of, uh, like, most people are like, oh, you can't mix MMA and pro wrestling. Well, look at who Rogan has had. He's had Jake the Snakes. Yeah. He's had DDP. Yeah. He's had The Undertaker. When everybody in the wrestling sphere wanted The Undertaker in that first year after the last ride documentary, Rogan yeah. had him. Not just had him, but in studio. Like, fucking, when they did Hot Ones, Taker was via satellite, right? Like, think of all the things, whatever. But Rogan had him first. I mean, uh, Taker lives in Austin. Rogan lives in Austin. So it's not Um, that big of a deal, right? But again, so WWE doesn't have that. Who's got Vince's back, right? If he walks or if he gets done dirty. Nobody. Is Shane going to have his back? I don't think so at all. (laughs) He doesn't even have his quad. You know (laughs) <laughs> right, he doesn't. I, was... I mean, Triple H, Vince, and and, and the Shane, right? That's the the holy trinity of quad tears, right? Uh, <laughs> so That's so oh, odd. Yeah. Oh, Linda, you got he's Linda. Got, nah, he's... Linda's like fuck you, okay. man. <laughs> oh, Stephanie, that Stephanie? has to happen. Maybe. Oh, wait, like two percent. Stephanie, Stephanie said peace, and that's the thing. Right, the the red herrings. If you look close enough, they were there. Right, yeah. Stephanie leaving. Right after uh, SummerSlam, whatever UFC was happening that night, they sold out fucking Allegiant Stadium in Vegas, the Raiders mm-hmm. Stadium in Vegas. Did Dana trot over to SummerSlam? No. Vince, Stephanie, so. and Trips went over to the UFC after they sold out. They doubled the attendance. If not triple the attendance, right? But they went over to the UFC, right? Could there have been talks then with Ari Emanuel, who might have been Dax H, allegedly, supposedly? I'm not trying to get sued, right? So there's been there's been red herrings if you look close yeah. enough. Yeah, I, I haven't heard anybody talk about that. Again, the 51 shares, those are Vince's personal shares. Yeah, yeah. Right, that, that is, is yeah. his sole ownership from again his grandfather, his dad that he bought from prior to what in 1984. Yeah, you know, this is the, the, the share that was supposed to, you know, basically go to uh, you know Shane and, and Steph that is no longer right, and that's kind of poetic justice, right? The last McMahon family owned WrestleMania, and you have. What should have been, right, if you're going to, through males, right? Jess McMahon, Definitely. Vincent J. McMahon, Vincent K. Yeah. McMahon, Shane McMahon, right? Yeah. The the patriarchy, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And he fucking tears his quad the same way that his brother-in-law and his dad did before him. So if that ain't a fucking omen, holy shit. Right? Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense now. Like, damn, man. I, I was just there like, what what the hell just happened? And then, like, the Miz looking over Shane's body like was just hilarious, and then Snoop Dogg coming in being the Shout best out to worker. Snoop. He's got to be the MVP of WrestleMania, he, right? He he, he himself figured it out. Like, oh shit, he uh, got it once. Yeah. Like Jessica Carr was like, this yo, good. elbow, elbow, elbow. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. So shout out to Snoop Dogg. He was a wonderful gentleman. Like my uh, my nephew used to play in his football league. Oh. Snoop Dogg is literally like out there in Compton, in Watts, in Inglewood, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. once a week, like he, because those are the four places that his his Snoop League, you know, play and practice at, or whatever. Yeah. He's there, literally teaching the kids how to tackle. I, I've seen him teach a uh, teach a, um, a, a like a five year old, like a pee wee football player. Mm-hmm. To tackle, 
oh, and wow. get the confidence to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Snoop is not just putting his name on shit. No, Snoop is about that fucking life, man. So shout out to Snoop for fucking saving that segment. Yeah, definitely, man. Like uh, he, uh, someone put on Twitter that uh, he he he's the best worker. Um, in, <laughs> he's the best worker now in the business, uh, which is which is pretty great. Um, but yeah, man, I'm. You know what? When I heard about Endeavor getting WWE, I wasn't as like shocked or like upset as I thought I was. Like I would be. Um, I think I've come to the term of like. Um, of like, you know, WWE not really like Vince not really having it. Um, I'm just sort of excited to see what kind of big events we're going to get with WWE that that like it makes it feel larger than life because after WrestleMania night one and two, I was like, yo, this feels like a spectacle now again, like back in the day. Like I was sitting there just watching it as like a regular casual fan and not really getting upset, you know. So I think it might be a good a good deal. Like I said, it, it will be, uh, but, you know, when we hear of, like, I mean, we've already had Saudi shows, right? Yeah. So what if we have, I mean, fucking uh, Zuckerberg of Facebook. Literally, they shut the fucking UFC Performance Center. And, again, this is one of the things that WWE did first, right? Performance Center, right? And then UFC mm -hmm. has the Performance Institute, where they shoot their ultimate fighter show, oh. you know, they do the, the fight nights, you know, the non UFC events and everything like that, the Dana White mm -hmm. Contender series, right? Mm -hmm. Zuckerberg fucking shut the shit down. And it was like, I want all this, uh -huh. and everybody else has to watch on TV. Like, it, it was essentially like fucking Caesar in Rome, right? Damn, man, that dude. So, so imagine. Right, I mean, uh, and yes, it was a one-off and what have you, but like, let's say if Ari Emanuel wanted to fucking what, you know, do a body slam. Okay, <laughs> so we're gonna have, you know, uh, at the fucking Endeavor or TKO. Oh my uh, god! Deal, we're gonna have an event, and no fans can come, but you can watch it on whatever streaming service. Also, one other thing, kind of thing yeah. ahead. So, uh, WWE's right steel with Peacock, right, yeah, is done in 2026. Oh. Also, UFC's deal with ESPN is over in 2025. Wow. So who's to say with all of the content that both companies, and much like the WWE, they purchase AWA, ECW, WCW, and have all the, the access to the tape libraries. So to it, is UFC bought Pride, bought Strike Force, bought Elite XC, you know, different promotions. And then they also have a, a bunch of regional uh, shows basically stream on UFC Fight Pass for the same $10 a month, roughly, mm -hmm. right? But who's to say that TKO doesn't have their version of the wrestling channel that you know, the UK thought of way before Vince did, like 10 years before Vince did. Yeah. But essentially, you get all of the UFCs, past and present, all the WWE and their related partners for oh whatever fuck price they want to. Yeah. Put and that's what I first see. Come 2027. Yeah. Whether it's you're viewing it in a metaverse or a fucking, you know, you know, underwater TV, you know, with, uh, I don't know, ethanol or whatever the fuck. Whatever we're viewing it on. <laughs> virtual reality. Whatever. But oh in 2027, God. they group up since they're all already in one row. They already have enough content to satisfy one of the two fan bases. That's true. So who's to say they don't group up? And, like, you know, WWE and UFC come to ESPN. Or hell. I mean, I heard ESPN isn't doing too well nowadays anyway. You know, yeah. Disney spins that off and never buys it. And ESPN becomes just UFC, WWE content, and then 3% baseball and football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a wild world that we live in, right? It and really a, a, is. A world that I never thought I would be in, but also a world that I've waited my entire life to be in. Good, bad, or indifferent, this is where we are. 
That's exactly why I wanted you on here. Cause I, I thought of you immediately when I saw this, I was like, Oh, his dream came true. The boyhood dream <laughs> yes. came true. Yeah. And I didn't um, have to fucking kick Bret Hart in the teeth with motorcycle boots to do it. <laughs> All right. So enough about Endeavor. Um, you went, uh, you went to Bloodsport, right? I went to Bloodsport. I went to, uh, Standard Deliver. I went to Mania Night 1 and 2. All right, so I know Bloodsport is like your favorite thing because uh, yes, talking you talking to Alex Coglin was like really fun to like listen to with that. So so put over Bloodsport. How did you like it? You know your experience, like what happened? I always love it. I mean, again, this is you know everything that I love about pro wrestling, everything that I love about MMA, right? The the fact that there is no no ropes, right? If you don't know what Bloodsport is, it's a wrestling ring, no ropes. And wins only happen by way of KO, knockout, or submission, right? I mean, in Bloodsport prior, you saw, like, the grizzly Cal Jack mm-hmm. literally hoist his opponent up and throw that motherfucker against the brick wall. And that was a KO. Damn. Right? Uh, you yes. have, you know, you know, former MLW world champion, filthy Tom Lawler, also of UFC fame, um, mm-hmm. you know, has competed in Bloodsport. I, you know, there was the uh, amazing match between uh, Killer Kelly of Impact Wrestling against AEW's La Problema, Marina Shafir. Uh, man, it, everything was amazing. And then the main event saw Timothy Thatcher face his coach in the former Metamorphs IWGP UFC heavyweight champion the war master, Josh Barnett. And again, if you guys haven't seen it, I warmly encourage you to go on to Fight TV. That's fight.tv to go ahead and order Bloodsport 9. It's an incredible deal. I don't want to do too much in terms of spoiling things, but oh, it is worth it. Uh, also, shout out to uh, the good brother, Eddie Torres and uh, Josh Barnett. Uh, Eddie Torres of the Rock and Roll Beer Guy podcast, as well as the comedy store, the famous comedy store, uh, but a company sort of wrestling podcast is Eddie uh, and Earl Skakel. But Eddie Torres and Josh Barnett actually brewed a beer for Bloodsport. And it's an wow. IPA. It's thick as shit. It's dark like both of their souls. It's amazing. <laughs> and I guess that, like, you know, you feel the essence of, like, you know, what Bloodsport is like. Yeah, anyway. metal, yeah. beer, fighting, <laughs> bloody. Rocking out. Fuck yes, let's do it. <laughs> and then you also met Kota Ibushi too, which was like, whoa. He also, yeah, he wrestled at uh, Bloodsport as a freelancer. And uh, if you kept up with uh, Josh Barnett's uh, social media, he actually picked up Kota at the at LAX here in LA. <laughs> and uh, so it was like, oh, it's a wild Ibushi because there was a, a lot of hyperbole <laughs> on where Kota was going to end up, right? Yeah, Much yeah, like yeah, Jay yeah. White. Right? Yeah. It's Mania weekend. He's scheduled for things. And I mean, historically, uh, you know, that has happened. If you saw somebody in town, you know, during Mania week, chances are they became, you know, everybody tells about like all elites and everything. Like, but it, chances are they showed up on an NXT sh- taping, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the crowd or, a, you know, a, a, a takeover and they showed mm-hmm. up in the crowd or whatever. So we, that's what a lot of people thought uh, Kodo Abushi was going to go, but obviously the tides of change uh, certainly changed during that that whole weekend, but it was great. He's a phenomenal guy. Uh, he's not one that I kind of – I wouldn't say he's my favorite wrestler, uh, uh-huh. even favorite Japanese wrestler, but he is, he's great. He's, he's great. He's personable. If you're a Kodo Ibushi fan, he gives you every reason to become a Kodo Ibushi fan, whether it's his – Ring in ring work as well as uh, you know, just being a fucking cool guy outside of it. And with that, we're gonna wrap up because we touched on a lot of topics, had a lot yes. of fun and and laughter. Um, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but like I'm, I'm forever, a laughable man. motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, and we could talk forever on like just random shit too. But uh, please again, put yourself over. Uh, according to Woods, uh, the Facebook. YouTube and Twitch is where you. I thought I would find it. Oh God! Bless you. Yeah, sorry. Oh <laughs> gosh. You told me to put myself over it. I just fucking oh, moco all over the place. 
Okay, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch is where you can find the Principal Podcast. Uh, on Instagram, I'm posting people fucking follow you out on trees and all that jazz. Uh, and Twitter, which uh, Marie so uh, graciously uh, decided to follow me on. Uh, but you can find me there. Uh, also, I have the Voodoo of the Woods podcast, which uh, I and former U of MMA champion Pius Ina Lalobo, better known as Voodoo Maximus, we usually break down the upcoming UFC fights, that is. And then you can also find me on this uh, little podcast after 83 weeks with me, uh, WWE Hall of Famer and creator of the NWO, Eric Bischoff. Uh, you can find me, Chrissy Olsen, George Ramosa, and Steve Coffin on that very show. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead and follow me on the stuff. Uh, I work hard to earn your follow. So uh, if you follow me, I will repay you in kind with dumb assery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Uh, which, by the way, randomly, uh, Eric Bischoff decided to follow my Twitter. And like, I told him, you know, thank you. I hope you, I hope you have a wonderful Monday. And I was just like, this is so cool. Like, you know, like I got I got a follow from Eric. Yeah, no, I, 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 that is something that I haven't even gotten, despite being on his podcast <laughs> what? for about a year and a half. And also, <laughs> but he's also been on my podcast three times, which is few more times than most people uh, yeah. so, and uh, you know got to touch base with uh, DDP which I hadn't seen since I worked at a, a FedEx office in Marina Del Rey, California like 10 years ago uh, and I was like yo I wanted to be a wrestler back then right yeah, and he's yeah, like yeah. lose your fucking gut and go to Booker T school and Booker T school had just started right uh, yeah, yeah. but then he goes oh, oh no I was like uh, I didn't lose my gut and I didn't get into wrestling but you know Eric Bischoff, right? And it's like, of course I know Eric. And it's like, and he popped. So I got a pop from that. So uh, if Eric Bischoff doesn't follow me, that's cool. Because uh, <laughs> I got to use him as a bait for DDP. So who is, yeah, who is yeah. talking to like Teddy Swims from YouTube, the singer, and uh, Edge. Uh, that was like a couple hours after the, the Hell in the Cell match with Balor. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. fuck, if I died tomorrow, it was all worth it. Yeah, and man. it's also karma uh, for all the dumb shit I see on Instagram. So there's that. <laughs> all right, I don't want to say a big thank you to uh, Kick and everyone that tuned in to uh, watch this. This will be out on, on all major platforms, so watch it in video format and audio format. Uh, the only thing that I want to put over, which I'm not even sure if you know, that I created my own wrestling planner. Yeah, did you do it over wrestling WrestleMania planner. weekend? Because there was 60 shows. Through the week of WrestleMania no, 29. I, I made this back in like December of last year, like January. What? Yeah. At the beginning of the year, I created the wrestling planner for all of my wrestling friends out there, wrestlers and podcasters. Uh, it has a note section. My favorite section that I love to always talk about is this right here, where like you can do your own star rating for matches. So I, I always say that, hey, you know, why not be your own Uncle Dave and give your own star ratings and color in the stars and stuff? So, okay, okay. <laughs> so quick hits. Uh, before it was Uncle Dave, it was Weezer Dooley, right, uh -oh. uh, in uh, Memphis. But also, if Marie Shadows was going to put in her calendar her seven-star match or something close to it, what would that match be and why? Oh my God, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, why does my brain go back to this one memory? Every time like I'm put on the spot, I like, go back to this one memory. Uh, so I guess like, you know, being a little kid, like growing up and watching Undertaker and Kane fight in the Inferno match, that match, like, I guess it's so significant to me that it keeps coming up when somebody puts me in like on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, for a first time for that, I would definitely make it. I'll, I'll make it like six and a half stars. Six. I'll do that. And if it were at the Tokyo Dome? Seven. Oh, okay. Tokyo Dome. All right. Just, you know, I was people, just wondering. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, this is all I want to put over. Uh, you can get it at Amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Marie Shadows um, to get the book. And, I, really I mean, you've got the uh, link tree with all the stuff, right? Everything. Yeah, yeah. Everyone yeah. knows where so to find me. Go ahead yeah. and buy. 
I mean, Marie Shadows is literally the best thing going in podcasting, newscasting, Twitch streams. My God, what doesn't she do? She makes me feel inferior because I feel like I'm doing less than Marie Shadows. So go ahead and buy the book, follow her on all the channels. And, uh, you know, there might be like a tip function in any of the places that you're watching that. Go ahead. I'm just saying tip your bartender. <laughs> right? All right, guys. Um, until next time, thank you for watching the stream. We'll see you soon.